Hey y'all, how you doing? In this lesson, we're going to explore Solidity Arrays and Maps. In our last lesson, we explored state variables and how we can store data on chain. We're going to extend this idea to lists of data. So in our last lesson, we took a look at these storage, these state variables to be able to store data. So you can see here, we've defined some primitive types that we're able to store information in. Now this information is stored on chain and it's persisted inside of our smart contract, which means the data and the state of that data will stay on chain. We'll be able to read it, we'll be able to manipulate it if we wanted to post transactions and change the data. And you can see here that we, we can have various different types for our data. So in this case, this is a string, this is an unsigned, this is an integer, 256-bit integer, 32-byte uh, uh, variable, a Boolean, so we can have true or false. And this one's pretty interesting. This is the address primitive type. And this is something that's a bit different than probably other programming environments that you've been exposed to. This is native to the Ethereum blockchain and it represents an address on the blockchain. That address could be a independently owned address, a user address, or it could be an address of another smart contract that we can call into and, and use. But in this lesson, we're going to talk about arrays and maps. So we're going to kind of extend our idea on what types of state variables we can define. And we'll also look at a little bit of uh, memory variables and how we can use those to just use as a, a temporary storage location that doesn't cost any gas to store on the blockchain. So let's, let's first talk about arrays. Now, for those of you that are familiar with other languages and environments, this is going to seem pretty natural. But basically, an array is a single state variable that allows us to store a list of values of the same type. We call this a reference type. So an array and a map in Solidity is considered a reference type because it really references other buckets of information or a list of buckets of information. So for example, maybe we want to use an array to store a list of addresses. And maybe those addresses represent maybe a whitelist for an upcoming mint within a, an NFT smart contract that you're developing. So how do we define that? Let's take a quick look. So I'm going to go down here and I'm going to define a new state variable. The same way that we defined any of the primitive state variables that we've defined before with one small difference. So we're gonna say, we're gonna keep a list of addresses. So the type is going to be address. And now we wanna make it a list or an array. And we're gonna just say, open and close bracket. That's gonna define that this is a, an array. And now we have to give it a name. We're gonna call it whitelist. So this will represent our whitelist addresses. Now, the syntax here is pretty simple. Um, this is, is going to be a state variable, so this is going to persist within, the state of it will persist within our smart contract. Um, it will cost gas to change information in it. But there is one really important distinction here. This array has a dynamic size, which means that we can add things to it and we can read the length of the actual array which means that we can loop over the array. So we could do things like develop a for loop that loops over every index in that array. Now, with any array in Solidity, the arrays are indexed by an integer value starting at zero. You can think of it like a, like a shopping list where you put like, you know, one, I have to get eggs, two, I have to get milk. But instead of saying one and two, you start at zero. So zero would be eggs one would be milk. And that's pretty similar amongst a lot of programming environments. We call them zero indexed arrays. And so Solidity uses zero index arrays. Cool, so now how do we actually get data into this list, into this array? Well, why don't we go ahead and just write a real quick function here that will allow people to call into this smart contract and add addresses to the whitelist. So I'm going to create a function. I'm going to call it add to whitelist. And we'll allow some address to be inputted here. So we'll say address new member 
and we'll make this a public function. And now all we have to do is call a specific method on this array in order to push data onto the list. So we're going to use a method called push to be able to do that. So all we have to do is say whitelist dot, which we're going to use dot notation, which is very similar to a lot of object-oriented programming environments such as Java, dot push, and then the, the, the value that we want to push. So we're going to say member. And this will add a new member to the whitelist array. Really simple. Now, if we wanted to now read how large that list is, we can use the length property of uh, the length method of the actual of the array, right? So we could just call it, if we wanted to say length, this would be, uh, get down here, you int length equals whitelist dot length. And I believe this is a method, if I'm not mistaken. So it is a, is a function we need to call. And now we can use this value to loop. And then as we loop, we can actually grab the different indexes in that array. So that's a, a really important, I'm not gonna, actually not gonna keep this in here because we're not gonna do any looping here. We're just showing how we can add data to it. Um, now, looping over the array is an important distinction. You'll see why that's important later on as we talk about maps. But quite simply, this is how you would put together a simple dynamically sized storage array that we can now keep within our smart contract. Now, there is another type of array. We could define a fixed length array. So if we knew the size of the array to begin with, we can declare the size up front. Um, we could also declare memory arrays. And memory arrays are give us the capability to be able to uh, not store information permanently on the blockchain, which doesn't cause any gas consumption to happen, which makes it free to execute. So I'd like to show that off real quick and see what, what that would look like. So what would a memory array look like? So let's see, we're gonna write, we're gonna create a new, a new function here. I'm gonna say function build memory array. We'll make this public. We'll give it a view and we'll say it returns an array of unsigned integers. Now we do have to give this a memory designation here. I think that's a requirement starting in like solidity 0.5 or something like that. So now the first thing we wanna do in this function is actually define our array. So we're gonna define a memory array with a fixed size. I'll talk about this in a minute, but I did put the view, view designation on here, which is very important. That means that this function will not cause any state change, which means that it will not cost any gas to execute, which means it doesn't cost anything, which is nice. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and define an array, just like we did before, but this array is going to store unsigned integers, and we'll give it the memory designation, and we're gonna call it simple array. Now the simple array, we need to initialize the simple array with the storage locations already in place because it's not going to be dynamically sized. So we need to really kind of set up our environment and set up that kind of memory footprint right up front so that we know exactly how much space we need. And we're gonna use the new keyword for that. So we're gonna say new uint open and close our brackets, and then put a parentheses in here with the size of the array that we're initializing. In this case, we're gonna make it a size of three. Now that's gonna give us three indexes to work with, starting at what number again? Zero, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So we're gonna start at zero. Now, in order for us to get data into this array, we actually have to type it out here. So we have to say simple array sub zero equals 
say five, and then simple array sub one equals say 10, and simple array sub two equals 20. And now we could go ahead and return that simple array. Now, this, the execution of this function does not cause any gas consumption to happen, but we are creating a space in temporary memory that allocates this data, creates the storage buckets, stores the information, and then returns it, and then gets rid of it. So the, 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 the calling program will have to take the returning values and do what they need to do with it, but this is not storing any data on, on chain. So that's one really important distinction. The other distinction is that we do not have access to the push and length methods that we had in the dynamically sized array that we defined up here. Therefore, we really can't loop over these arrays, right? So that's, that gives you a little bit of a limitation with what you could do here. Now, there are some really interesting patterns that emerge from this type of functionality. I, go, I went ahead and linked some of, uh, some of those down in the, in the notes. Um, where you can use these types of arrays combined with, with state variables to be able to, to look up various things and keep track of various things and return certain values. There's a lot of really, really interesting things that you could do here. But this, at, at a basic level, is how we would actually define a fixed length memory array. Right? So that's that part. So we've got, we've got, dynamic arrays, we have fixed length arrays, we have memory arrays, we have storage arrays. Uh, so there's very there's a lot of different ways we can use arrays within Solidity. The key point or the kind of the, the sharing property amongst all of these is the fact that we index them by a number, right? So by, by an integer value starting at zero and all of the types that we store within it are fixed. So we have to declare what type is stored within the actual list or the actual array. Now, I think this is probably a good time to move on to maps. So what, what is the difference between this idea of an array and a map? Now, you'll see as you, as you progress in your Solidity journey, we use maps all over the place. Maps are kind of the core of most of the standards that exist today. Um, things like the ERC-20 and the ERC-721 standards, uh, most of the core information about the ownership of a digital asset is stored within a map. Now, on the surface, maps may seem very similar to arrays. And you'll see the kind of the immediate difference is that with a map, we can index our array or index the map using objects, not just integers. So we can use things like maybe a string or an, or an address to be able to index into the actual map itself. Now, again, just like arrays, this may seem very similar to you if you're coming from other environments. You may have heard the term hash map, or associated arrays, and things like that in other environments where instead of using, say, an integer, we use a value like value one or first name, right? Where we can kind of index it with some other type, not just an integer. That's exactly what maps allow us to do. Now, like I said, this, this data structure a map is at the core of most of these popular standards. Um, and it basically allows us to store a database of state, say for users of the smart contract. You can almost think of it like a table, right? Um, like an Excel spreadsheet that we can go ahead and put within our smart contract itself. Now, for those of you that are very finance minded and use Excel a lot, hopefully that visualization kind of snaps right into your head where we can have this, this table information that we can keep track of within a smart contract. And of course, we can write methods that allow us to manipulate that table. So let's take a look at a simple example. Now this simple example is actually one that's used very frequently in a, a lot of different production smart contracts today. Let's keep track of balances by a given address. So how do we define a map? So I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna go 
to the top of our smart contract and I'm gonna go right below the array we just did and I'm gonna define a new map. We're gonna use the keyword mapping. We're gonna open at parentheses and now within this parentheses, we're gonna define the key type that we're gonna use. So the, the actual, how we're going to index this map and then the values that are going to be stored within this map. So you can think about this as a large list of key value pairs. And we see key value pairs all over programming, right? Where we can basically just say, hey, this is the key to this value. And we can extract or read that value using the key. And you'll see in a second why this is really important with using keeping track of things like balances. So I want to, in this case, say I want to keep track of addresses as our key. And the value, we're going to use a little arrow notation here, is going to be an unsigned integer. Then we're going to give it a name and we're going to call it balances. And that's all we need in order to define a new mapping in our smart contract. Now there are some interesting details here about how maps work within Solidity. The, this def definition assumes that all of the values already exist in this table. So we can go ahead and index this balances table by any address on the Ethereum blockchain right off the bat. We don't have to go and say, hey, does this index exist? If it does, then we could just add to it. If not, we have to create something and then add to it. It's assumed that it's already there. Now that also exposes some interesting limitations, I will say, in terms of mapping where you can't do things like loop over a map. There's no kind of like for loop that you can write that will iterate over every index in the map itself. Which, you know, in some in some cases you'd be like, wait, why, I, why wouldn't I just use an array? Um, the reason is, is that with a map, we have random access directly to a value if we have the key. So it makes reading data extremely efficient. Think about it, if we had balances that were indexed by some integer value, say like in an array, and we wanted to say, hey, what a, th this address has some balance, how do we find it? We have to keep two arrays say an array of addresses, an array of balances, loop through the array of addresses, find an index, and then maybe use that index to index into the balances array. If we had a lot of users in, in this, that could become extremely computationally complex and, and it just not be efficient. This gives us this random access method. We could get right into the value we need if we have the key. If we don't have the key, there's no way to get the value. So we need the key. So we've defined the map, but now how do we actually use this bad boy? So let's go ahead and let's write a little method here um, to add, say, a balance, uh, add some value to the balance, right? And these are contrived methods um, just to show you some, you know, just how to work out some of this, this information. So I'm gonna go ahead and define this, this a new function, and I'm gonna say add balance. And let's go ahead and say this is going to add a balance to a given address. So we'll say address, um, say call it member. And we'll make this public. And why don't we go ahead and return just a unsigned integer? That's fine, right? So we're going to return the balance of the address, but we'll also we'll also increment this. So. What we can do is, just like arrays, we can index them, but we don't index them by the uh, by the by an integer value. We're going to index them by the key value that we've defined in our map definition. In this case, an address. Awesome. So what we could do is, we can use that bracket notation. So open bracket, and now we could say, I want to grab this member's address. Now we don't have to worry about whether or not this index exists or not. It's assumed to exist. Now there is a default value there, right? The, the, the member is not going to have a default value of say 100, right? The default value um, is different based on the value type. Now the default value in Solidity for an unsigned integer is zero. It's not undefined or anything like that. It's just zero. 
Um, now, Solidity does have default values um, for various different primitive types. I'll go ahead and link uh, a reference in the, in the notes below about that. But for the unsigned integer, it is just zero. So we can assume it's zero. So I'm gonna go ahead and add to that. So I'm gonna say plus equals 10. So we're just gonna go ahead and add 10 to that, uh, to that line. Awesome. So now, and you know what, we probably wanna put a memory designator here, right? I think it usually complains about, uh, we may not need that, that's okay. We'll keep that out, I didn't put it in the other one. We'll keep it out for now, it doesn't matter. Okay, so now we, we went ahead and we incremented this members balance by 10, and we can go ahead and then return the balances for that member. And hopefully you see here that we are directly accessing the members balance by using their address or the, the parameter here's address as the key to the balances map. That's extremely important. That's the biggest distinction for a map to an array is that we have that random direct access if we have the key. That's really powerful. Because think about it, we can address any, anybody on the Ethereum blockchain, any address can be indexed within this mapping, within the context of this smart contract. That's like insanely powerful and exciting, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a very powerful concept. Um, now we just simply do the same thing here and return it. Now it is, it is important to double down on the fact that we cannot loop over uh, over maps, right? We cannot loop over maps. So they are not iterable. We cannot get a for loop and loop over them. So that's that's an important distinction. And there is some there are some links in the notes there where there's some interesting patterns that arise with using memory arrays and and uh, and maps to be able to to go ahead and, and combine them together. So we can write loops and grab grab information within maps uh, if we need to. Awesome. So there's one other thing I want to show you, and then we're going to look at a little bit of the Open Zeppelin contracts to, to end this off. Is we do have uh, we do have the the capability to not only read the, um, the the members parameter here, but we can actually read the person that's calling into this contract their their specific address. Now we didn't really touch upon this yet, and we're probably going to go deeper into this in in videos in the future, but what we can do is we can actually read the person that's calling into this address. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this out and we have some global objects that we can use in order to read this information. The, the most apparent is being the message and specifically the message.sender. So we can go ahead and grab the message.sender and use that as the index. Now this is a global object that contains information about the transaction that was sent to this call. And this has information about the sender. So we have the sender's address. Uh, so anybody that calls this method now can go ahead and increase their balance by 10, which is kind of cool. And uh, you know, if somebody finds this, they could be like, oh, I could just increase my balance forever and I'm gonna have the biggest balance on the planet, all right, right? So they could just keep calling into this. Um, they don't have the ability though to pass in an arbitrary address like we did before, where we were able to just say, hey, I want this address to go ahead and increase the balance. So that's a, a bit of a distinction. Okay, awesome. So that's that. What I want to show you now is if we ju jump over to this tab here, Open Zeppelin, which is a really popular framework for developing smart contracts. I'm going to go ahead and jump into the Open Zeppelin contracts project. And I'm going to go into their contracts here and go into token, go into ERC20, and I'm going to go into the core ERC20 smart contract. And I just want to show you really quickly how this works. So Right off the bat, this looks pretty familiar, doesn't it? So we have an address mapping that is going to an unsigned integer of balances. This is what powers, and this is the data set, the data structure for balances in any ERC20 token. It's simply just a mapping. 
It's a table of address to balance. That's it. Then we just have methods around around here that allows you to um, either, if, if, depending on the, the style of ERC-20 that you have, you manipulate this list in different ways, transferring balances from and to addresses. It's just changing the balances, the values under these keys. As simple as that. Now you can see here, mappings can be nested to, be, to create two-dimensional maps. So remember I used the example of an Excel spreadsheet before, and an Excel spreadsheet, you know, you can think of it as a two-dimensional table. In this case, this is really just an Excel spreadsheet with basically two columns. Um, now this extends that where we have for each address, inside of that we have a two-dimensional column structure that contains the address and, the, and, and some unsigned integer value. So the value here is actually another mapping which maps between address and unsigned integers. So that's why we can have for one address, we could say, hey, I want to have X amount of other addresses that have allowances to my balance. So say, for example, I've got five friends that I want to tag as they're allowed to use the some balances in my in my balance. I could do that using this type of data structure. And that's what kind of powers that flow. All right, so we've covered a lot in this video. Um, definitely touching on the surface of these two very, very important and essential data structures that are going to be, you know, everyday uses in your in your Solidity development process. Um, they come in, you know, as you can see here, they are a core part of many of the standards that are currently very popular, and. Um, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot more to learn here. So we're gonna we're gonna continue to progress from here. We'll probably go into some some of the different types of uh, function types that we can declare into the into the future, um, and we look forward to more. So if you like this, please like below, subscribe, give us some feedback. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, happy learning, guys. I'm just having a great time learning this with you guys. Thanks.